Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the Catalyst webinar series presented by the Education Committee for the Southern California PGA. The Catalyst webinar series is a bi-weekly educational platform for creating success and change in your club and career. Very excited and proud to introduce Dr. Allison Kurt with us this morning. Allison uh, needs no introduction. We all know her. She is a highly decorated PGA and LPGA professional. She is uh, one of nine women to achieve the highest PGA credential earned by an instructor, one of two women to be a dual master professional in both the LPGA and PGA. She has over 30 years of competitive background playing and uh, was a, fun, a, a full scholarship recipient, a two-time academic All-American at Florida State University. She also has her doctorate in uh, psychology and a uh, private practice in uh, marriage counseling as well. Good morning, doctor. Welcome to the Catalyst webinar series. Thanks, John, appreciate it. Excited to be here and thanks to all the attendees for getting up this morning to watch the presentation. Indeed. All right, so let's get started. Um, coaching juniors in the mental game. Um, again, thanks so much for everyone that's logging in this morning. I think these Catalyst seminars are really great for a free education. Get up early on a Thursday morning, get your brain going, learn something new. And um, today, talking a little bit about mental game and working with a population that I think is a bit underserved when it comes to golf. So when we're looking at getting mental coaching, I think a lot of people will look at that as being the last thing that they end up doing they'll buy a driver first they might even go to a golf lesson second but the very last thing that they want to do is actually work on changing themselves and i know a lot of the instructors in this catalyst this morning have a large population of juniors and so working on performance and mechanics skill refinement those are all great but what an awesome time in a junior's development right now to start working on mental game and so as we work through this presentation today, I'm going to cover a couple of things that you can immediately bring into your teaching practice to work with your juniors. First, we need to start off learning a little bit about childhood development. So as we're working with our juniors, understanding the different stages of life that these junior golfers go through will really help you apply the mental skills that we talk about today at an appropriate time and an appropriate age. So if you're working with four-year-olds, you can begin working on emotional regulation. If you've got some elite high school players, you might get into more of some performance issues and transferring what they've learned to the golf course, to their AJGA competitions immediately. So understanding where your junior golfer is in their phase of life is really important. So I think that's the best place to start off with is talking about childhood development. And then the top teachable mental skills that we'll cover today, anxiety first and foremost. Um, us as teachers even sometimes get anxiety when we're playing in our section events. We know our adult students go through anxiety and certainly our junior golfers at some point can begin experiencing anxiety when it comes to performance. So we're gonna lead off with that and then go into emotional regulation. When you think about the different biological changes that are happening in juniors' bodies as they go through puberty, they're certainly going to have a roller coaster of emotions that they experience when they're trying to perform and learn and compete. So how do we handle those emotional um, emotions that we experience and regulate them and use them to improve performance? Certainly in this day and age, we have a ton of distractions, whether it's social media, electronic devices, social groups. So how can we train our juniors to work with distractions and use them in a way that's productive through the creation of pre-shot routines? And then confidence. How do you build confidence or coach confidence in juniors? And part of that is how we believe in ourselves, what we say to ourselves, the scripts, the narratives, our stories all set the stage for how we feel about ourselves as a golfer. And then lastly, we do all these wonderful lessons, we do all this great training with our juniors, but when it's time to pull the trigger 
on the golf course in competition, how do you transfer that learning? So that's our outline for this morning. We'll certainly have an opportunity at the end of the session to go over um, any questions. So if there's anything that doesn't make sense along the way, certainly write it down and we'll have some time to go over that. Many of you already know me just from presenting in the section or playing or seeing you um, around Southern California. But to give you a little bit of a brief background about myself and how I've gotten to where I've gotten is I started playing junior golf at the age of seven. And the mental game was never really discussed with me until I got to my third year of college, which I think is quite extraordinary because the conversation about the mental game is really expanding in this day and age. But in the 90s when I was in high school and then early 2000s when I was in college, it just really wasn't talked about in my culture where I was at in my life. So the experience of the different emotions of failure and frustration or trying to work on a swing move and not quite getting it for a long period of time and then having to learn patience, those were skills that I just sort of had to develop on my own. And then luckily enough, in college, there was a graduate student who approached um, our Florida State program and wanted to do some testing for his doctorate degree. And this testing was having the girls on the team rate their emotions at different times in competitive rounds and different times in practice or recreational rounds. And that was sort of my first exposure to having a mirror being held up to me, reflecting what I was experiencing on the golf course and learning whether that was productive or inhibitive for my performance. And the basics of my mental game training were really just the Bob Rotella books as they were coming out and being published, putting out of your mind and golf is a game of confidence. And then all of a sudden Pia Nilsson and Lynn Marriott started to break out a little bit with their publications and their texts and talking about pre-shot routines. And so this really sort of inspired me as I began my PGA career to look at students in a completely different way besides just these human beings learning skills and motor patterns, but this whole other world that they brought with them to the lesson tee. And particularly with juniors, working with a five-year-old who has expectations that are being built because of the culture of what the parents or the family is setting up, and then experiencing frustration so early on and not knowing how to handle that. Those experiences, it, really inspired me to want to learn more about human behavior, which led me down this path of becoming a licensed psychotherapist and earning my doctorate in psychology. So as I start looking at the areas that I want to educate others in, I feel like I want to fill the void or the deficit of what happened in my story and be able to share education to my fellow teachers and professionals about things that you can start doing early on in life for your junior golfers to help them either just enjoy golf longer or perform the best that they can. When we look at when is an appropriate time to start teaching junior sports psychology, now, the moment that you're able to get your hands on them and start teaching the game, that's the time to start talking about mental game skills. When you think of, uh, about yourself as, as a parent, if you're a parent and you have children, you start modifying behavior from day one. Um, don't touch hot things or uh, make sure you sit here or when we stand in line, this is how you behave. We're modifying behavior very early on. So when you're coaching kids in a clinic setting or a one-on-one -on -one setting, you're already modifying behavior by using the game of golf through skill refinement. But what about modifying behavior by starting to share with them how to think or how to use certain words to coach and, and coach themselves and build themselves up? So when is the appropriate time? Now is the appropriate time because it really builds a platform and a blueprint for how they will play in adulthood. So all of the skills that have been learned in youth really transfer over into their adult competitions into their adult recreational play, who they are in different athletics, and who they are as a person. You'll be surprised that many of the juniors that you've coached years back, if you talk, talk to them as adults, they'll share with you, you know, you really taught me this, um, this thing in my golf swing that I carry on with me into adulthood. Well, what if they said, you know, you really taught me how to be calm and confident on the golf course, 
And now when I make a presentation at my company, I feel calm and confident as well. So these skills transfer into other areas of life. And really the basics of coaching juniors in the mental game is taking the sports psychology skills, which are very, very cognitive and very laid out in black and white, if you will. And we just modify the words and the approaches to make it more junior-like, more childlike. Uh, it's the same thing as teaching a golf lesson. The words and the verbiage that you use to teach an adult, you'll cater that and modify it, maybe even gamify it for your junior golfers. And all of this, we really want to apply at the junior stage of life. So making sure where they are at their term of development, we cater our coaching and mental, um, mental game approach to where they are in their phase of life. So let's talk about the different phases of life. And you might even have some students come to mind as we're looking at these three main stages. When we look at elementary school age children, and this is a very interesting time because these kids are really understanding categories, categories such as gender, who's taller, how old one person is, who was born in January compared to December. So these categories begin to be very basic, but going into school, they start to learn this is the bathroom that I use, or this is where uh, the girls go, and they start to understand categories. You might have kids line up by birth date, who's the oldest stand in the front, who's the youngest stand in the back. So categories are starting to emerge in their world. This is also the first time for elementary school age children where they're starting to separate from constant parental supervision. Now, most of their day will be supervised by some sort of adult or mentor, but it's the opportunity to start to branch out from their parents and have other influential adults begin to modify and mold who they are as a person. So you as the golf coach, again, a different category, parent, teacher, coach, have a really prime opportunity um, to influence these juniors because of the opportunity that they're away from their parents. They're starting to understand that their feelings are their own and other people have other feelings that may differ or be similar than their own. And there's an emergence of having a less egocentric world. So instead of their prime focus being survival and being fed and being warm and being loved, they're starting to understand that there's other people around me or I need to understand um, other people's space. So there's a, a modification from being less um, focused on themselves, less egocentric and understanding that there's a world around them. Then as they evolve and go into middle school, into adolescence, social skills and building relationship with peers start to become a priority. There may even be attachments to friendships, like I have a best friend now or I have a crush on another person. So these emotions are starting to really emerge and it really becomes more diverse besides just anger, happiness, sadness. The emotions are becoming more complex. And they might even start to hold two emotions at once. How can I be excited and scared at the exact same time? Having the verbiage and being able to label the emotion starts to emerge with middle school kids. So just looking at these first two categories, if you're working with a seven-year-old compared to a 13-year-old, your verbiage and your articulation of the different emotional experiences that those two juniors are going to experience will be different in how you approach that. Also in middle school age, problem solving, looking ahead, planning for the future, this skill set is starting to emerge. A seven or eight year old may not be thinking much past the present moment, which in a way could be a good thing, but a middle schooler might be thinking, what happens in high school? Or what might I be doing next week? They're starting to understand the world around them is constantly moving and evolving and that there is some planning and preparation for the future. Lastly, we get into high school age, our teenagers. This is going to be near the end phase of puberty, which in that sense is a whole other plethora of changes going on. We have biological changes, hormonal changes that are going to definitely influence mood and the ability to regulate emotions. 
Many of you may have worked with teenagers and just experienced how one day they're in a great mood and then the next day they're kind of moody, but they're performing just the same. And that is just the being victim to how their body is changing. Interpersonal relationships will expand into a much deeper level. They might even experience for the first time love for another person. And then working on managing and balancing extracurricular activities. And I've got golf practice, but also maybe AP classes. And then I'm also doing piano lessons. And I've got family relationships and, and chores and things to work on. So managing a multitude of different responsibilities. And finally, at the end of this category is launching from the nest and transitioning to college. This may be the first time that children, again, are leaving constant parent supervision or adult supervision because they are becoming adults. And how do they manage washing their laundry or feeding themselves or finding how to balance their time without having a parent constantly guiding them? So looking at where your junior golfers are in their life will help you be able to apply the mental skills with the right verbiage and with the right intensity for those different age groups. So as we move into anxiety and nerves, it's a human response. We have all experienced anxiety or nerves at some level. And particularly junior golfers may start to, when they begin, begin becoming more involved in competition, experience an unsettled feeling when they're trying to tee off on the first hole. Or if they win a tournament and all of a sudden there's expectations being built and they're starting to feel nervous going into the next tournament, how can you handle that? Well, explain to them that anxiety is just a state. It does not stay with you forever, even if you have an anxiety disorder. It can change. And in fact, anxiety attacks don't last forever. They last about 20 minutes. So it's a constantly changing, evolving mental state because our brain has a natural three option step for responding to the environment. It can run away, it can try to attack and fight, or it can just paralyze. We call that the flight, fight, or freeze response. Many of you might be just familiar with flight or fight, but there is a freeze response that has been discovered where oftentimes people will shut down and just not be able to perform when anxiety becomes too overwhelming. It's important to just open up the dialogue with your juniors and ask them, well, what does anxiety feel like to you? Anxiety to me, standing and playing in a section championship is going to feel way different than maybe a seven-year-old playing in their first U.S. kids event. And anxiety might change at different levels of performance. So going to drive, chip, and putt regionals may feel different than just teeing it up at the local club championship. So ask them, can you identify what does anxiety feel like to you? Like where in your body, which part of your body tends to get the most um, anxiety? What does it look like? And when does it happen? Does it happen before even getting to the golf course, in the car ride with mom and dad, when you're on the first tee, at the driving range? Ask them, when does it show up? Because if you can start to establish a pattern for when the anxiety begins to build, then you can build a blueprint for how to manage it and how to cope with the anxiety. And then certainly having a conversation about pressure. I think so many juniors talk about, I have so much pressure on me. Well, what actually is pressure? In my opinion, pressure doesn't exist. Yes, we have air that's kind of pushing on our body right now, and we could call that pressure. But psychological pressure is induced. It's manifested. So a parent cannot literally put pressure on another person unless they're literally touching them. Now they can create expectations and how the junior interprets and processes those expectations may be what they call pressure. And so having that conversation about, okay, where are your expectations? Where is your skill set? And what's the difference between those two Let's change that word pressure and just use what are our expectations? What are our goals? What do you hope to be able to achieve? Is this coming from an internal place or is this coming externally? And how can you manage that with the different relationships in your life? Because certainly when children feel 
that pressure, when they feel that there's a lot of expectations from adults around them, that can induce the anxiety. And without adequate tools and coping skills, it can be very difficult to perform. So when anxiety starts to attack the body, we know that there's a whole chain reaction of responses. Certainly the muscles in the body will begin to tighten. Anyone who has ever felt nervous, perhaps you're right about uh, to have a car accident and you slam on the brakes and hoping that your car doesn't skid into the car in front of you, your arms and hands on the steering wheel will tighten. As soon as the muscles tighten, the heart is going to respond to try to start to push more blood out into the body. So then the heart begins to beat faster. When that happens, faculties are being used. And so oxygen is not taken into the body as deeply. Therefore, our breathing will shallow. Well, now all of a sudden we have this chain reaction of tight muscles, fast heart, shallow breathing, kind of the same thing that you might experience if you were sprinting or running. But the worst part of it is we start to apply meaning. And that is where our thoughts get ahead of the present moment. What does this mean? What if this happens? What if I slam into this car? What is that going to do? So if I stand on the first tee and anxiety is hitting me and my muscles tighten, my heart gets faster, my breathing starts to shallow, what if I completely top this ball for the first tee? What, are, what is everyone going to think about me? Well, this whole scenario certainly makes it rather difficult for the messages of the motor pattern to reach the muscles to perform a free flowing swing. Very, very difficult for that to happen. So what do we do with anxiety? What are the tools that you can teach your juniors? First of all, stop using the word nervous. Stop using the word anxiety and reframe it. If your junior says, you know, I'm really nervous about this tournament, could nervousness really just mean you're excited? You're excited, but you don't know what's going to happen? Could that be nervousness? And if we start to change the paradigm of what nerves and anxiety mean, instead of it being this bad, awful thing, maybe it's just I'm really eager and excited to see what happens. And the reason that you're feeling this way is because you care. If you weren't invested in this event, if you weren't invested in your own progress or trying to play well at NCAA championships, you wouldn't care. But because you do care, that's a really important thing. And you as the coach, you're invested in your junior. Hopefully your junior is invested back in you in the process. And the reason that this anxiety or nervousness comes up, which we will reframe to excitement, is because you care. And so notice where the feeling comes from. Is it the difference between a skill set and the demands of the environment? So if I haven't broken 80 from the white tees and I'm going to play in my first AJGA event where we know all those kids are flirting with breaking par, maybe there's a discrepancy between where I know my skills are at today and what the environment is going to ask of me. That can certainly create the feeling of anxiety. Maybe going into a tournament that I've never played in before or a golf course I've never seen, unfamiliar experiences, fear of the unknown can create anxiety. If we're too focused on the outcome, like I need to shoot par or I need to break par in order to qualify to make it to the U.S. amateur, that drive for a particular outcome can start to increase anxiety. So with conversation, you can really unpeel the onion, if you will, to understand where is this coming from. And even perhaps fear of judgment. I've had juniors share with me that if they don't play well, they may feel that they've disappointed their parents. And so they put induced pressure on themselves to play a certain way to please their parents. And ask them, so what's important in the moment? When you're on the first tee and you're ready to tee it up, is it important to take faculties and focus on what your parents might think of you? Or is it more important to get the ball lined up properly, position yourself to adequately hit the fairway, focus on breathing. The brain likes to answer questions. So if you ask it a question, what's important to me right now, it will want to respond. The task at hand, that is important. 
And certainly working with anxiety, breath and the control of breath will be of utmost priority. Your breath never leaves you. If you can control it and use it in a way that is facilitated by being a deep breather, when time is crunching, you'll be able to perform under pressure much successfully. Music can certainly help many cope with anxiety. And there is certainly a time and a place to use music and power to help. So I would make sure that a lot of the kids that have their Beats by Dre on, they're listening to music. What are they using it for? Because that's really important. Are they using it to entertain themselves because they're bored while practicing? Are they using it to regulate how their body is moving with rhythm and tempo? Um, are they using it to change their mood? Music can oftentimes enhance productivity, but it can also be very inhibitive of learning. If any of you have ever felt like you're just kind of in a bad mood and all of a sudden you start noticing that you select your music to match your mood, you can amplify that negative mood if you start playing some hard rock or some really sappy songs because you're going through a heartbreak. But if you're really excited and you play some really happy music, that can amplify your mood too. It can alter your arousal level. So the power of sound and music is very, very great. And if you train your juniors to use music in a helpful way, it can enhance their ability to cope with anxiety and also their performance. We immediately have an innate synchronization with the beats, two different sounds. So if we are trying to do a particular putting stroke or a particular rhythm or tempo in chipping, we'd like to try to match the music with that motor pattern. So for example, I have a couple of songs here at different beats per minute, BPM, to match heart rate, arousal, rhythm, and tempo. And I want you to think to yourself, what might be uh, the motion in golf that I could match to this? So let's start with 70 to 80 beats per minute, and hopefully you can hear this through my speakers. Okay, so when I think about different athletic emotions in that 70 to 80 beats per minute, I'm probably not going to do a sprint race and run as hard as I can. I'm probably not going to be pumping iron as fast and hard as I can. It's kind of a slow, relaxed rhythm, a little catchy. So this might be great for putting or some slow motion chip shots, but if I'm gonna to try to bust a driver, that may not be the best beat per minute that's going to match me. Now, if we go to 90 to 100 beats per minute, this would be a sample of a song there. Now, it may seem very subtle between those two samples, but the beat per minute is actually exceptionally faster than our 70 to 80. So when we go into 90 to 100, my body is going to start to respond on a faster level. My heart will beat faster. Um, it might even change my arousal level with my focus. And of course, my rhythm is going to change as well. Now we get into 110 to 120 beats per minute. I don't know about you, but if I've got a three foot slider putt, that may not be the best song running through my head to create a nice rhythmic putting stroke to make that challenging putt. So now we're gonna look at 130 to 160. Okay, so a little bit peppier, certainly faster. Maybe if I was running on the street, I'd be able to pick up my pace a little bit more because my body's going to respond to that. So helping your juniors build a playlist that matches. If you're working on full swing mechanics and really trying to repeat rhythm and tempo that is facilitated, you're gonna hang out between 70, 80, 
and 90 and 100 BPM. If you're in the car driving to the tournament and you're trying to get pumped up, you might go closer to 130 to 160 beats per minute. And so building a playlist that really matches what they're trying to accomplish um, during their practice or how they're trying to cope with their anxiety. So when is the time not to use music? Um, because I'm not a huge fan of using music with juniors at all levels. It's when they're trying to learn a new skill. So the brain only has a limited capacity to be able to process information. And so if I'm trying to learn something new and do some drills and really be aware of what's happening in my body, but my brain's also trying to filter out sound, um, yes, it's great for working with distractions, but it's really going to use all the faculties of my brain and the learning is going to be exceptionally slower. Now, there certainly is a different type of person and I've run across this in my career where they say, yes, I'm studying for a test and I study for a test better when I've got music playing on in the background. And that is sort of a whole different level of focus for individuals um, and their brain works differently. But for the terms of golf, when you're learning a new skill, you really want to refrain from having too many distractions so that all of your faculties and energy can go into learning what's happening. All right, so now we go into regulating emotions. So we have anxiety as kind of that number one thing that juniors tend to experience as they're playing in competition. But what about some of the different emotions? that they experience, failure and frustration. As we look at this little guy going through putting, I feel like he's pretty confident, made, made the short little putt, even whiffed it first, but still made it. He's still doing okay. Maybe some of you have seen this video before. I feel like he's really uber confident now, such a budding golf star. And then he's gonna try it again. He's getting himself ready. He's already made one putt. But now he missed that putt. And now he has a whole wealth of emotions that he's experiencing. Hopefully none of our juniors actually respond like this on the golf course. But maybe at some point they have. And what do you do to regulate them? So I think of the term set, S-E-T. So we have a shot that occurs. For example, this little guy missed his short putt. We have an emotion that all of a sudden our body produces. So for this little guy, it's frustration. And then once he starts to age, he'll have a thought because the thought will start to apply meaning to what that is. So the thoughts and the emotions really work together to establish the meaning of what happened in our environment. So what you say to yourself will set the stage for the effectiveness of the next shot. So a missed short putt, plus the emotion of frustration could equate to, I'm not good at this. And if that thought starts to resonate enough, it then becomes an individual's belief system. So the things that we say to ourselves are extremely important. Now, what happens from a brain perspective for our emotions? I've got a short video for you to watch. This is from Dr. Dan Siegel. And he talks a lot about how parents and children interact with one another and what happens to the brain. So he has a hand model of the brain when looking at emotions. And some of you may resonate with this um, as you watch him go through his uh, short One of the most rewarding explanation. experiences for me has been to study brain science and apply it to the experience of parenting. And the hand model of the brain that I use to teach parents is very useful to understand that. So if you take your thumb and put it in the middle of your palm, put your fingers over the top, this is a very useful model of the brain. And when we can actually see in front of us what's going on in the brain, then we can change what the brain does. So let me walk you through very basically what happens in this brain and the structures in it. And it goes like this. The spinal cord comes up, represented the wrist, and then you have coming up into the skull, the brain stem and the limbic area, which work together to help regulate arousal and your emotions and the way you have a fight, fight, freeze response. These are below the cortex, the limbic and brain stem areas, and the cortex is this higher part of the brain that allows us to perceive the outside world, to think and reason. And this frontmost part of the brain, right behind your forehead, so the person's oriented like this, is 
is actually the part that regulates the subcortical limbic and brainstem area. This regulation is very important because sometimes we can have all sorts of things happen in our life. We're tired, we're exhausted, someone pushes a particular emotional button, and we can flip our lid. So rather than being tuned in and connected and balanced and flexible, we can lose all that flexibility, even lose moral reasoning, and act in ways that are terrifying to others, including our children. Now, you can actually bring yourself back online and come back to the high road and make a repair with your child, and that's important to explain to them. And you can also use this hand model of the brain to explain to children, even as young as five and six, how to understand when their emotions are rising up from the brainstem and limbic areas here, and how it's overriding the prefrontal area and making it so they may be about to flip their lid. So I've had kids come tell me that they're about to go flip their lid and they need a break. They need a timeout. And by even just naming that, they can tame it. And that's the power of using the hand model for ourselves and our children to help us all make sense of what goes on in the emotional communication that we have in the course of day-to-day -day life. And I think that explanation is really important because as juniors can start to name and understand their own emotions, they begin to regulate when they're going to get to a tipping point, um, which we know then is not going to allow performance to be amplified. So a very easy way for them to begin to really frame their emotions is through this process of first identifying where it is in the body. So if they're feeling anger because they miss a putt, where does that anger hang out? What shape might that anger be? Is it a triangle? Is it um, a jagged star? What color might that anger be? Red, orange, and can you give it a name? Maybe they can name it anger, but some younger kids might name it some sort of funny name, like a Ralph or a Fred. And then lastly, once you have the location, the shape, the color, and the name of the emotion, then you can use breath to begin to expel it from your body. So taking deep breath and really expelling this red triangle called anger out of my body. It just gives a process for taking uncomfortable emotions and being able to cope with them. Now, oftentimes our body will respond with tension based on the different emotions that we feel. And it's important to build a somatic awareness of where that tension is in our body. So someone that is ang angry or frustrated, a lot of times will hold their frustration in their jaw, which then transfers down into their neck, into their shoulders. So this is an example of what I call the potato chip drill. And so having a junior hold a potato chip in between their teeth and try to swing without breaking the chip will allow them to feel more relaxed in their body. And having that awareness of when an emotion comes up, where is that tension located and how can I dispel it and desensitize it so I can swing a bit more free fluidness. So as we go into distractions, we have so many distractions um, in an external world. We have kids that are on the range looking at their cell phones, or social media, they'll hit two shots and then Snapchat somebody, they'll hit a couple more shots and then maybe Instagram. So with all these different distractions, we also have distractions on the golf course. We've got water, out of bounds, what are playing partners doing? What are my, do my parents doing watching me? Crowds and spectators, and then other competitors, sounds. So with all these different possible distractions, the best way to practice with this is to practice with distraction on purpose, but to redirect the attention through mindfulness. And mindfulness, which I've said before in other presentations, many of you may have heard this, is really doing one thing at one time and knowing that you're doing it. So when you're on the range practicing, you know that you're practicing, you're only practicing, and you're only focused on advancing that golf ball. You're not on the range thinking about when your friend is going to come so that you can come chat or who you're going to text next or which song you're going to put on your playlist. So doing the one thing at one time to stay in the present moment to eliminate the urge or the impulse to want to think in the future 
about what's going to happen or to reflect on the past in a negative way about poor performances or what the previous shot was like. Now, using distractions during performance is really helpful because I think that the more we practice with a stimulating environment, when there's a purpose for it, the easier it gets to performance time. So if you're coaching one of your juniors, you may have them set up their shot to go to the red flag, and then during the middle of their swing, create some sort of distraction. Throw something on the ground, make a sound. And this is actually really fun for junior camps and clinics where I'll have a group of kids start to make a whole bunch of distracting sounds while a child is trying to hit a drive. And so it can be a fun way to practice with distractions. And then all of a sudden they get onto the golf course and someone maybe kicks their bag on accident and it doesn't even get onto their radar because they've had so much practice with the distractions that on the golf course they don't hear it. And that also trains them to be in the moment doing that one thing at one time and knowing that they're doing it. Using pre-shot routines can certainly help with that distraction. So going through what Pia Nelson and Lynn Marriott have coined the think box and the play box, creating a pre-shot routine that allows a space to safely think about what's going to happen, what's the wind doing, my golf club yardage, where do I need to carry and roll out to, where am I going to aim? This also gives me an opportunity to think about mechanics, but then to switch into being an athlete. So taking that deep breath, visualizing the shot, maybe even having a color attached to the shape of the shot to enhance that imagery and really preparing the body to become an athlete and to play. So having that entire space to think and going then into the play box. So stepping into that space where there's no thoughts, it's just rhythmic breathing, it's a picture of how you want the shot to go, and then executing it. Now, if you start to transfer the thinking into the play box, um, when you think, you think. So if there's a moment where you're over the golf ball and you're thinking about mechanics, it will create an interruption in the motor pattern that's trying to be delivered to the muscles. So teaching your juniors and creating a fun way to build a pre-shot routine, putting sticks on the ground or using spray chalk to say, here's where I want you to think in this box, and then I want you to hit the golf ball in this box, will allow them an opportunity to do something so that their attention is not going to distractions. Now, as we move into confidence, scripts, the things that we say to ourselves, a schema is a belief that we have about ourselves, and it starts very, very early in childhood. The beliefs we have about ourselves as children tend to also filter into adulthood. So you may, as an adult, have sort of this running theme of like, I'm not good enough, or I'm not going to um, fulfill my expectations. Where did that come from? A lot of time that's built from childhood. And so you as a golf coach have an opportunity to change negative patterns in your junior golfers and to help them build this feeling of confidence. So I'm a terrible golfer. I'm not good enough. I'm a failure. Those are perpetuated through our behaviors and our coping styles. So having your students understand what are the words that they say to themselves and really writing them down and looking at them, then you can start to reframe them and change them so that they don't perpetuate in a negative way all the way through adulthood. A great exercise for identifying in your juniors what schemas are already starting to develop and be developed. And again, these are developed just through interactions with parents or teachers or even peers at school, is have a whole bunch of blank statements. And these are just a couple of samples. I'm a blank golfer. I'm a blank bunker player. And when you have the student look at these statements, they're going to write down the very, very first word that pops into their mind because that's gonna be the belief. And then a split second later, their brain is gonna kick in and try to change it to make it socially acceptable. So even you looking at these different statements, you might say, I'm a horrible putter, but then you might reframe it and say, well, I'm, I'm not so bad, I'm mediocre, because that might be more socially acceptable. Well, the very first word that popped into your mind, I'm a horrible putter, that's the schema or the belief that's running under the radar that really needs to be repaired and changed. So once you identify those schemas, 
then you can really start to reframe them and change them to a negative, uh, a positive point of view. A great exercise that I like to use in my camps and clinics would be the power of self-statements through an athletic motion. So what I'll have is 10 golf balls laying down and about 10 feet away, put a towel on the ground. And the junior will pick up the golf ball and they'll underhand toss in the air, trying to land the ball on the towel. And every time they throw the ball, they're going to use some negative self-statement, even if it's not believable, but like I'm a horrible ball tosser, I'm not gonna land on any target, I really suck at this. And they're gonna note how many of those golf balls landed on the target. Then they're gonna repeat the exercise, but this time, every time they throw the ball to land on the towel, they're gonna to use a confident or a positive statement. Like, I'm a really good ball tosser, I can totally hit the target, I'm good at this, I'm a great junior golfer, and they'll note how many landed on the towel. And more times than not, they start to really see how many more successes they get with using positive self-statements rather than the negative self-statements, and that's in the moment of using athletic motion. Discuss their experience with them. What was it like to use the positive words? What was it like to use the negative words? And then note how many of those balls landed on the target. This confidence resume was shared with me through a colleague, many of you know, Rick Sessinghaus. He has a great online platform called MZ Coach. And this confidence resume is a great way to go through the back and recall positive experiences with every single club. So if you think that you're a horrible putter, you can go back in time and think about times you've made really great putts, maybe a super long putt for birdie on the last hole to clench a win, or you made a really tough three footer to have an eagle. So you build a resume of all the times that you've been really awesome with your golf club, and now you can start to cope with the negative beliefs. So if you think that you're a horrible bunker player, you can go to your confidence resume and have a whole list of times that you've been great out of the bunker. And be descriptive with the times that you've been a rock star out of the bunker. What did it look like? What did it feel like? Where were you at? Be descriptive as possible. So lastly, we're gonna go into transfer of learning. So I think this is a big topic in just golf coaching is how to take things that we've learned on the range and transfer that to the golf course. We certainly know that the range is very static. There's multiple tries. The timing is significantly different and we're stationary to a target. But on the golf course, things change. Lives are different. The environment and wind conditions change. And the spacing between the shots is significantly different. It may be five to 10 minutes before you hit another drive. So using a range to create a stimulating course environment is a great way to start to transfer learning. Changing targets constantly. Implementing the pre-shot routine changing um, and timing the shots where you may not hit a driver for five to seven minutes because there's just not enough time um, as you're going through your pre-shot routine and then you're pulling out a seven iron and then maybe you hit a small chip and then you walk over to the putting green and you hit a putt. So then you come back and four to seven minutes later, you're hitting driver. Playing the golf course from the range, having the yardage book in their pocket, pulling out the yardage book, going through it, the entire process of what it would be like on the golf course, but you're certainly being able to use that on the range. I know it's sometimes tough to get out onto the range, uh, to the golf course, to be able to practice with your juniors, so this is a great way to use the range as a stimulating environment. Plus, this is also to transfer the learning if you have a great motor pattern that's being developed and they're working on maybe swinging more from the inside, what a great opportunity to start adding in distractions or start changing targets because it's now going to be a dog leg right compared to a dog leg left. And so that is where I feel like kids need a lot of coaching rather than just hitting a whole pyramid of golf balls with their driver. And they start to really use the range to modify what happens on the golf course. And this is just a short video. These two juniors, they're working on shaping shots. So trying to hit the golf balls in the air, they're gonna swing at the same time Girl on the left is going to try to hit a fade. Boy on the right is going to try to hit a draw. And they're going to try to shape the shot on purpose to knock them in the air. So 
So just a fun way to practice different um, skills on the range to make it much more robust. So as you're thinking about how to coach your juniors differently and how to bring in small components of the mental game, again, the theme is now is the time to start coaching the juniors. And you don't have to refer your juniors out to a sports psychologist. You as a golf coach, you're educated enough. You've performed in competition enough to know these skills and then how to translate them to your juniors. Start the conversation. Start talking with them about it. Create worksheets for them to work through. I'll have a lot of my juniors oftentimes carry a notebook with them and we'll talk about the different emotional and mental experiences that they've gone through. And then using my own personal experiences or the different skills that we've covered today, we're able to build a great and strong toolbox for them to cope with all of these different um, performance issues to help them play better. So hopefully this gives you a little bit of a sample of some things that you can do to coach juniors in the mental game. And maybe you've got some new and fresh ideas for the lessons and the kids that you're working with. Um, any questions at all, feel free to um, type those in or to connect with John. We'll have a little bit of time to answer them. Um, you're certainly welcome to follow me on any of the social media handles. I'll also oftentimes put out some stuff about the mental game and you're welcome to reach out via email or phone if you have any particular cases that you want to talk about or juniors that you're struggling with. Um, thanks again for being here this morning, and at this time we'll open it up for questions. Thank you very much, Doctor. Um, can you talk a little bit uh, more in depth about the, uh, the difference between the think box and the play box? Absolutely. You can use whatever term feels comfortable for you and your student, but there certainly needs to be a space prior to hitting the shot where you're going through all the different cognitive processes to get set up for success. Cognitive stuff or thinking stuff would be calculating your yardage, which swing mechanic do I need to showcase, which golf club am I going to hit, everything that's very cognitive and thinking based. You want to get that out of the way first. Then when it's time to stand over the golf ball and actually execute a motion, we want to try to be as clear as possible and less cognitive thinking as possible. So even try this um, for yourself. Stand over a golf ball and think really hard about a swing move. And your performance is probably going to be less preferred than if you thought about the swing move before even walking into hitting the golf ball. So you want to think before you actually hit and execute. Over the golf ball, we want to try to be as clear as possible. And uh, when, when talking about uh, the schema, it, 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 I, I think I, I picked up a, uh, a negative impression of a schema. Is, is, there, uh, is there positive schemas? Absolutely. Schemas are just the beliefs that we have about ourselves. So you may have a schema or your story of who you are. You may be really confident with the driver. And no matter what environment you're in, you're just, you're totally going to outdrive everybody and it's going to be super straight. That's a positive schema. Um, the feeling of confidence, that comes from positive schemas. So if you're really, um, you're really excited to public speak and you like presenting and anytime you get up on stage, you feel like you really shine, that stems from positive schemas, positive beliefs. But sadly, on the flip side, all of us on some level will have negative schemas that have been created. And those negative schemas will interfere with our performance. So the tools that we talked about today help combat the negative schemas that we have. But with the juniors that you work with, you probably can already start to highlight the areas that they feel really confident in. You can see it in their body language. You can see it when they talk about um, maybe they're a great chipper or they're awesome at flop shots. You also want to highlight those positive schemas as well because that's one of the seeds that you want to water and plant with to build confidence. Okay, thank you very much, Doctor. You're welcome. I do have another question here from, uh, actually, I got a few. Uh, what books would you recommend for juniors and adults? 
All right, great question. Um, I really like The Inner Game of Tennis by Timothy Galloway. He does have The Inner Game of Golf, but I actually think The Inner Game of Tennis is written better, and then you can just translate out the tennis um, words for golf words. So definitely that. I really like anything from Pia Nelson and Lynn Marriott. Be a player. Um, play your best golf now. Those are all great ones. I do like the Bob Rotella book. So golf is a game of confidence, putting out of your mind. And then locally in Southern California, we have Dr. Joe Parent, and he's written Zen Golf and Zen Putting. I think those are uh, fantastic reads as well. And lastly, a great book by Gio Valiente, Fearless Golf. I like that because it talks a lot about um, the expectations that we have and how that creates fear. I think that's a really great one for um, all of those books are easy enough to read for middle schoolers and above. As you get into some of the elementary school kids, there's not a lot out there about mental games. Um, so these would be more for middle school to adults. On behalf of the entire section, uh, on, on, well, this is a thank you from uh, Bob Madsen, looks like here. On behalf, uh, please forgive me, the, it's only one line at a time that I can read. On behalf of the entire <laughs> section teaching committee, thank you for all your contributions and congratulations on all your hard work and accomplishments. Excellent webinar, well done, from Bob Madsen. Thanks, Bob, appreciate that. And thank you, Bob. Bob is a tremendous supporter of the Catalyst webinar series, and we appreciate you uh, being on each and every week uh, uh, supporting the educational program. I believe those are all the questions at this time. Uh, for those of you on the uh, call, as usual, we will be sending out a short quiz on Dr. Allison's presentation today, along with the YouTube recording of the presentation. Uh, please take the quiz and return it to Sharon Kerfman at skerfman at pgahq.com. A score of 70% or higher will earn one MSR for attending this morning's Catalyst. I want to thank everybody for your time and your support of the Catalyst webinar series. Have a great day. Dr. Allison Kurt, thank you very, very much for your time and expertise and continuous uh, support of the Catalyst as well. I think this is the fourth time that you've uh, presented on a different topic. Uh, pertaining to teaching and instruction, and uh, we are very, very grateful for your support. Thank you very, very much. You're very welcome. Have a great Thursday, everybody. Indeed. Thank you. Bye-bye.